Hey everyone, we are back for another Let's Play video, and by we, of course I mean with me as always is Corey. Say hi, Corey. Hey, how's it going, guys? And as you can see in this video, we'll be playing Sengoku 3, which is a beautiful game for the Neo Geo that I believe was developed by, uh, what are they called? Dream Factory, I think? Mm, I will double check. I believe, that. yeah. yeah. You, you were more uh, an expert on this title. I, it, this one was more obscure to me growing up, so. Yeah, it's. I think I actually only discovered this many years later during the emulation craze, once Neo Geo emulation became... Uh, really possible right yeah. okay so let's jump in and let's start playing so go ahead and press uh, a button Corey all right uh. all right so I will start out as the big guy I guess all right oh, yeah, we'll do an easy level yes definitely oh those timers uh, always get me on the yeah <laughs> <laughs> they want to get you to spend your quarter uh, and right. <laughs> uh, and walk away from the machine as quickly as possible to make uh, time for the next person to put their quarter in. Right. Uh, so yeah, some Goku 3. Uh, oh wow, I don't even know how I did that move right now. Really beautiful looking game, uh, great pixel art. Quite a sophisticated fighting mechanic. But like a lot of games back in the day, I'll definitely link in the um, description of this video, I'll link to um, a good kind of gameplay guide for it that gives you the full move list for each character and explains the gameplay mechanic. Because there's fancy stuff. Uh, in general, there's two main attack buttons, and depending on what sequence you do of them, you'll do different attack sequences that have different attacks and finishing attacks and then uh and by finishing i don't mean it'll you know kill the enemy for sure like a mortal combat i mean just the move that ends the sequence and uh you can cancel out of some of them there's a double forward double tap forward dash attack uh, with either button it does something different and there's definitely some special moves you can do in some cases like um uh, at least for most of the characters when you have them grabbed some different buttons do different things and there's even like a really strong um kind of super suplex or something spinning pile driver kind of move i'll see if i could get it out at some point with this guy but not everyone has that move that i, I think that character you're controlling right now cannot do that yeah and we're um, playing this with a different method than before uh, oh right the fight game Yep. Uh, yeah. it, a great yeah, system. Yeah. Right, yeah, it's sort of, uh, well, it, they said they maybe repurposed an emulator or yes. an open source. So it's both an emulator and a uh, way to play online uh, right. via emulation. So. Yeah, so it's a website. Um, it's kind of a, um, what do you call that? Kind of like a hosting service for online gameplay and it's completely free which is awesome and it works in coordination with this emulator which i'm almost certain they took an open source emulator and they added whatever special technology in it to tie into their online uh co-op or versus multiplayer which is fantastic like the quality uh of um basically using modern techniques to combat the uh potential gameplay uh, input lag is easily on par with the capcom beat-em-up bundle on steam which was already very good but so far we've been testing um this game on it and even with the capcom bundle sometimes we experience some lag for a few seconds at a time right I don't mean a few seconds between each frame, but I mean for a span of maybe 10 or 20 seconds, we'd right. notice some very visible frame, frame drops and input lag. Whereas so far uh, in testing this game, it has been absolutely, uh, it seems exactly like we're playing in the same room, which is yeah, really remarkable yeah. since Corey is in France. Uh, Corey's in the US and I'm in France. Right. Um, yeah, it, it definitely, we had issues with the Sega, uh, yeah. Steam releases, and this game there it is. Yep. purchased via GOG. Yes, the ROM. Yep. There isn't really any 
built-in multiplayer or anything like that. We would have to, you know. But I, you get the ROM anyways. Yes, so when, when you, you buy do that sort of yeah. purchase. So we went with this method, and it's yeah. It's, I'm, I'm amazed to be honest. With you. I expected yeah. some kind of problems. But <laughs> yeah, and the really great thing is that it's. Uh, it works with the emulation for several consoles, several classic systems. So I'm pretty sure we now have a really fantastic way to be able to play um, many other um, many other classic games from many systems uh, without having to use something like Parsec or having to find a unique uh, solution for every different uh, platform. Like, we did find a really functional uh, system for Mega Drive emulation. I can't remember what it was called. It begins with a K or something like that. I don't remember. The online... Uh... Uh, yeah, we, we used... Um, we had to use a separate software to yeah, exactly. play. Uh, but the, the emulator was fantastic. It was Kega Fusion. There, yeah. Um, Oh yeah, and it wasn't a K, it was like Himachi or he, something... Right, a different um, yeah. sort of a network uh, exactly. software to connect. But, I mean, that yeah. worked very well too, but it was a little more complex to set up. You know, exactly. This is actually pretty easy, you just download and set up a... Right, and this will be a great... Right. Yeah, and this will be a great solution for many systems, which is also fantastic, far more convenient. So uh, this is not a sponsored video, everyone. No, but no. but thank thank you. Shout out to the people that uh, make and maintain Fightcade because uh, it's a beautiful free um, system. Yeah, you were always very big on SNK and Neo Geo, which I mean yeah. I, I had played some of it back in the day, the more popular games. But yeah. uh, you've always had probably. A more appreciation than I, I did because of being yeah. exposed to it more, I suppose. And, uh, you know, like, you were, we were looking at ways to either play or look into these games more, you know? Right. So this is, that was the result. This was this, so. Yep. Hey, everyone. Uh, Corey, keep fighting for me. Uh, I have an alarm going off on a phone nearby. <laughs> um, so... I'll wait for you to come back so you can uh, carry my dead weight for me first. Oh, I think it turned itself off. Hold on a second. Oh no, it didn't. Be right back when you want. Okay. <laughs> Take these museum pieces down. Okay. I am back. How many times did I die? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think you died at all. Yeah, awesome. uh, there was only a couple guys to handle, so... So we only died in real life of embarrassment and <laughs> not in the game. <laughs> right. And uh, my apologies everyone uh, who has played this game before and knows what they're doing. Like I said, this gameplay and fight mechanic is actually quite advanced. And uh, we've never played this game before for any real length of time. I played through many years ago. Um, didn't play through the whole game, but just to kind of see more of the pixel art and stuff like that, and uh, right. yeah. obviously was impressed and talked to Corey about it uh, at some point in the past, uh, probably a few times. But um, but we're definitely uh, not only not really familiar with the mechanic and move set yet, but also trying to maintain the conversation and turn off phone alarms at the same time. So yeah, it's it's easy to. Um to flub up your side techniques. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, talking about uh, nerdy stuff, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, and for those who uh, might not know yet, if you've not seen our other videos, Corey and I are both professional pixel artists, and uh, we are working on our own retro indie games. And one of the games we're making is called Metro Siege, which is a similar genre to this. It's a beat-em-up game, uh, very uh, most similar to Streets of Rage 2 and Final Fight. And one of the reasons I mentioned this game to Corey is eventually we would love to enhance the uh, graphical abilities of the Metro Siege engine because the Metro Siege was designed to literally make games for an older, less powerful 16-bit system than the uh, than the Neo Geo uh, or than the arcades back then. A little closer in power to kind of the Mega Drive. 
But the goal is eventually to, when we're done with Metro Siege, to upgrade that engine to be able to uh, to compile games for uh, hopefully Neo Geo itself, but maybe some other uh, more powerful 16-bit systems. Absolutely. And we'd love to make a uh, Golden Axe style game, but based on the universe of the other game we're making called Damon Claw, um, which is a nice kind of magical quasi-medieval Dungeons and Dragons style world, right. um, but with its own unique twists and um, kind of... Uh, monsters and uh you know different magical creatures and stuff like that um so we would love to be able to flex more art muscle directly with more freedom of memory in metro siege we literally had to create these giant sets of animations for the player characters and enemies out of a handful of body parts to fit it in the very humble memory constraints of that particular system Whereas the Neo Geo had so much more memory that uh, you could do far more completely freehand full frames. So you could design animations based exactly on how you want them to look instead of always doing a compromise between um, what can possibly fit in memory and you know trying to make it look as good as possible but within those severe constraints. So you're creating most frames of most animations based on what you can do with existing body parts and not how you would do it otherwise if you could completely use totally new memory for each frame of animation. So. Yeah. Although the combined technology of mm. modular animation with the extra memory too uh, can... Get you, you know, the most visual quality, smoothness of animations, variety of animations. Uh, let's, I guess, do Italy now. Okay. Um, but yeah, absolutely correct. That's a thing. Uh, people can sometimes call the modular animation style kind of paper cutout style. And if you're dealing with severe memory constraints, it can be quite obvious or more obvious that you would like that the animations are being made by moving body pieces around. Right. So it's less fluid. There's no what you call like, uh, what do they call it? Sub pixel animation going on. But at the right. same time, if you have enough memory to spare, you can get the both, best of both worlds, where you can have even smoother looking animations, um, because you can put lots of body parts to really smoothly transition and have sub-pixel animating in those given body parts, um, but then yeah. also make other tween anima uh, frames in between uh, by moving the body parts around and reusing body parts. Um, yeah. So like Corey was saying, you can get even smoother and more moves in by combining the two. And the Neo Geo is powerful enough with its abundance of sprite power that you would be able to use the modular animation system even though every body part would have to be its own sprite, you wouldn't get sprite flicker even if you had this many characters on screen. Whereas if you tried that with the Mega Drive, it, you'd get really bad sprite flicker uh, in a two-player game. Yeah, you'd have to be very uh, mindful of how you use it on Mega Drive or something. Yeah. But like if you had this extra memory, I mean even a game on the Neo Geo, if you're doing something that's really big like yep. everything we fought in here so far has been like a humanoid sized enemy right but like if they have a giant guy you're probably still gonna want uh some other method of animation yeah, because absolutely. It's, it's gonna get unruly at a certain point to animate yeah. all that yeah yeah exactly a lot of time for the artist to do uh using a lot more memory and of course um uh yeah, those are the two big ones. So the memory and the production time. Yeah, well, and for, you know, it's one thing for, like, a big studio. Like, right. You know, has budget to, With a giant to budget, budget yeah. right. <laughs> this is a weird level. It's a very small environment, and you have to go back and forth literally a couple times. I've never seen that in a beat-em-up before. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess they're getting more mileage. Yeah. Uh,
there's a nice, uh, powerful spinning pile drive move that some characters can do. They still make the grappling really automatic. simple yeah. uh, and automatic, which is, I mean, it doesn't happen too often when you don't want it to, but right. it's, yeah. it's still a little easy. Yeah, you know. the big reason it doesn't happen that much accidentally uh, in the case of slash em ups is, of course, because it's long range. You're using right. a long range weapon, so you're not accidentally getting so close to the enemy that you accidentally grab it anymore. Uh, whereas with a beat em up, where you're you have to go in within grabbing reach to attack an enemy in the first place, or often you're much more likely to accidentally grab, which is why in Metro Siege. There's actually a mechanic, an input you have to do, uh, hold attack and tap forward toward the enemy, and your character will literally reach out, like lunge forward and reach out to grab the enemy. Um, and that not only, not only enriches the fight mechanic and the gameplay, it feels very, um, and is very intentional. It feels like a visceral thing you're doing, like, I'm going to grab you, which is right. more like a modern um, game like uh, God of War has a grab button, and yeah. uh, Kratos will lunge forward. And I mean the old, I'm old, so I'm, I'm going back to the old PlayStation 2 and 3 games. I don't know if the modern God of War game has the same thing. I assume so, but I'm yeah, not sure. I, I've not I played it. I keep up with the series. I did like the first game. And, and yeah. Um, but yeah, so in Metro Siege, there's a, a specific grab lunge thing, um, which ensures you won't accidentally grab an enemy when you're trying to get out of the way or something of something. And if they had uh, used that, if they had applied that same input mechanic in so many classic games, you would have never had those frustrating situations at times, like in. Um, in uh, Streets of Rage 3, there's a level with these small moving um, cars on rail tracks. And the screen rumbles to let you know they're coming. And some come high on the screen and some come low. And uh, so you're in a sometimes hectic... Uh, there's a, There's a... You need to get out of the way either by moving upward or downward really quickly. But there are also enemies in the same situation. So often you're going the same way to get out of the way of the train car as enemies and you could just automatically without wanting to grab an enemy and then you're stuck there for a second until you use a desperation move or some other way like a jump button to cancel out of the grab you didn't want to do in the first place and very often that split second of extra time to realize you've accidentally grabbed someone and do something about it it's too late um, and then there's the possibility in games like Streets of Rage 3 to even grab your co-op player, your companion, uh, whatever you want to call them, your partner, grab them accidentally, and then it's the same kind of annoying situation. So um, I think we found a nice solution for Metro Siege, which I'll definitely um, want to carry over when we can do a game more in line with this in Golden X. Even though, kind of like what you were saying, it's far less necessary in a game where you're using long-range weapons because accidental grabs are much less likely to happen. I find it interesting that... Um... We're used to going back and forth now, but... Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That, that keeps messing me up. Yeah. <laughs> but, um... We've been trained, trained like Pavlov's dog. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I just sip some water. like based on an arcade. It, it's, um, we do, I guess, have unlimited coins or something. I yes, think. well, we oh, just yeah. keep pressing the button. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, long as, that so long as that button on our controllers don't fail, we have unlimited continues. Thank goodness, because obviously if you don't know what you're doing, this game was designed to eat quarters at the arcades. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's very... Uh, but speaking about, nice yep. Playing. Sorry. I, okay. I like, I like the. Uh, I think the characters are where it shines. The character animation. Yeah, their design too is really nice. Yeah. Really nice aesthetic. I'm not so uh, hot on the, these uh, girl ninjas here. Their design looks a little silly. Yeah. Uh, but the playable characters and most enemies and bosses are pretty cool looking. 
and just look great against the environments. They really, you could see, and we talked about this in other videos we've done, large areas of fairly low con contrast mono or duo chromatic. It just lets every important moving object, um, you know, any pickup or hazard or character just really pop out beautifully. Right, exactly. I like I like this guy this big guy's batter up um, uh, remind me the next time I die if I don't think of it I should switch characters oh right yeah so people can see the other available play playable characters but I was going to say speaking of the um, the grabbing mechanic and accidental grabs I did notice because there are two basic uh, attack buttons in this game they moved the grab items on the ground uh, move or input to the second attack button which does make it less likely ah damn it <laughs> i picked him again i was yeah, talking and playing guy, at the same time yeah. all right awesome thank you but yeah so it makes it less likely to accidentally grab a health pickup when your friend needs it because i think all of the multi-attack sequences start with the a button i might be wrong uh Maybe. Uh... I think because it's quicker like a jab, but I'm saying that, but in the case of this character, button B is actually much quicker than button A. Uh, I almost forgot about the, uh, the fourth, like, range button. Or oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, throwing stars or whatever your character has. Yeah, yeah that, that super full screen special move, I've Yep. The times I've triggered it have been accidental. Yeah. But I, I'm assuming that that wouldn't happen in the arcade. You know, like with an arcade yeah. setup or whatever. Button layout. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I, I don't remember for sure. I, th I think uh, you got it to come out by pressing all four buttons because kind of as a hail maker. Cause well, you know, uh, yeah, there's the, like the log thing. Um, <laughs> whatever. Right. You know, yeah, the full that's screen magic. To mean exactly, but yeah. Desperation, yeah. Like I, like I was explaining to Corey in a pre, uh, before when we were testing this game, that um, it's uh, it's a common trope in the mythology of ninja that's really ubiquitous. If you watch a lot of ninja themed anime, like uh, Na the Naruto uh, whole family of series uses it a ton. And the idea is it's a substitution jutsu, so a ninja can trick you. Uh, into thinking that you've attacked or successfully gotten a, a, an attack on them. But in actuality, you didn't know it somehow, but you were attacking what they substituted themselves with, which for some reason became a log, like in most pop culture um, ninja-based stuff. Oh, well, I mean, every, you know, ninja should carry in a spare log. Yeah, firewood, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It gets cold in Japan too sometimes, you know, you gotta keep a, a whole stack of firewood in your magic uh, other dimension pocket that yeah. lets you carry tons of giant heavy things. No, I, I totally understand, like, the, the cultural yeah. Uh, aspect there. Yeah. But it's yeah, it's one of those to, things. It's yeah. funny to see when you, you're not expecting it, I guess. Yeah, uh, or not, yeah. Time. yeah. Exactly, not familiar with it. I think I have a vague remember being a kid watching some anime. Uh, it was probably something Ninja Scroll, something I shouldn't have been watching as a kid. But I was probably in my early right. teens or whatever. But uh, I, I think it was a, a there was an anime like that that uh, I think it was the first time I saw that trope, and I thought it was also very strange. But then you know over the years I saw it over it's and over funny, again. I, I watched a, a decent amount of anime too, and I just I guess maybe I. Yeah. I've just forgotten about it or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, I haven't but, seen it enough times to yeah. think it's, about it much. But. It's super specific to ninja, ninjutsu. Right. Yeah, it's like sense. it's not gonna be in Dragon Ball. There's no ninjas in Dragon Ball that I know of. Right. No, I, I mean like like you mentioned, I mean I watched Ninja Scroll and stuff too, mm. but yeah, I don't know. Like it, yeah. I know I, I suppose a lot of them weren't ninja themed. Right, you know, exactly. The, uh, the, stuff I watched. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Akira you're not gonna see it in. Uh, right, most yeah. mo most anime is not ninja based, except That's for true, more lately yeah. with Naruto, which is where I definitely saw it constantly in nearly every episode. Yeah, that, I'm that, exaggerating slightly. That one was, a, I, I don't know, I, for whatever reason, 
this and I just never had it. Yep. Yeah, I was the same way. I avoided it for the longest time. Um, same thing with, uh, especially One Piece. Originally, the super cartoony art style turned me off. Right. Um, and, and I think it's yeah. partially because, you know, you'll hear about it and it, it's something that gets really popular. Yeah, exactly. And, but then it will keep going. And yeah. so you, by the time you yeah, think exactly. about, well, maybe I'll try to watch this, it's like, <laughs> there's like 500 episodes or exactly. something. Exactly. And you're like, well, I don't know if I want to watch that now. Right. But, well, it is know. really <laughs> important to go online and find what's called a filler list of any big series you want to watch. Right. Because yeah. entire seasons or half seasons of this series are not canon, complete garbage tier uh, basically fake episodes to give the um, mangaka time to make more issues of the manga uh, yeah. because otherwise you end up with nightmares like what happened to um, uh, what was that um, King, uh, King of Thrones is that what it's called um, Th throne damn it what is the TV series uh, HBO series um, oh, Game, of Game of Thrones that's the oh, one okay. um, where they ended up in the series, they got ahead of the actual author. Right, right, yeah. They deviated, like, yeah. the last few seasons or something. Exactly. And it, and it, yeah, and I, th I think, you know, it didn't go well story-wise. Yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. Like, sometimes it's obvious when you're watching an anime when that happens. Like, you'll yep. see, like, it'll be a slightly different animation team. And yes, style. lower sometimes quality animation. Even, yeah, sometimes they'll even mark it with, like, a different song or yeah, something. Yeah, th that's, you know? that's so, nice of them when they do that. Is, yeah. But there are filler episode lists for every anime series ever and that helps you avoid watching any non-canon episodes. Yeah. And so it cuts down to like maybe a third, a quarter, or even a half of the episodes you need to watch and that makes it far more manageable and more importantly I guess we have to press a jump button? No? What's going on here? There we go. Now, we, now it triggered the automatic... Uh, animation nice. nice little cinematic there oh you can jump down I'm gonna get myself killed being down there because <laughs> I um, the button set up for an Xbox controller uh, the way I set it up isn't great it's easy to forget what button does what that's why I've almost not jumped at all so far while right. playing yeah. yeah I I guess I wasn't thinking too much about how I set up the buttons but I guess yeah I exactly Oh, that's good. Ooh, I, uh, I, I kept forgetting yeah. the throw button. It's like I use it as like, it's like the top button, and I don't I use it with these anyways. Yeah, I just did something really cool accidentally that reminded me there is a parry in this game. Uh, for if you're controlling a character with a sword, if you do, uh, I guess your sword attack or an attack that uses your sword at the exact moment they're doing an attack on you, you'll do an actual parry, uh, which is very nice, but man, that timing has to be pretty damn exact. Because I finally made it happen once accidentally. Right. Do trains ever come? Uh, like now that you're fighting? It. Yeah, me it's neither. Playing, yeah. well, maybe it's safe to be down here now. That would have been cool if they kept coming, and uh, the Neo Geo definitely has a sprite power to pull it off. It's it's that kind of stuff has happened in so many games that you're I'm yeah. sitting here waiting for it. Yeah, exactly. I did. I didn't want to go down there at all, ex uh, specifically because of that. But maybe they decided, uh, you know, killed the players too much or something. Else. Nice. I'm throwing giant cartoon-sized bombs at the. Uh, at the enemies. Oh, I'm out of them, I guess. Oh, I noticed, I just now noticed the timer, too, on the level itself. Yeah. Like, I guess if you don't beat the entire thing, that's yeah. kind of necessary. <laughs> yeah. you know. I've got to say that um, this game is nearly a masterclass of avoiding what we call confetti syndrome. 
even look at any particular character, whether it be the player characters or enemies, they have a really cohesive color scheme that doesn't go off in too many directions. They didn't, like, give a character, like, a bright red shirt and bright green pants or anything. So there's, like, any one thing has such a cohesive... Oh, you switch between either the uh, shuriken or the uh, bomb. That's interesting. But yeah, so, like, everything. It's a big areas of monochromatic or dual chroma chromatic. Everything is mostly one color with a secondary accent color. Um, and it just makes everything so clean. Everything reads so well. That was a nice power move. I just got out without quite knowing how. Exactly how to, it's. I would say, as for, like, even though the environments, like, I would prefer to see different environments. I suppose. Yeah. I guess based on the theme of the game, it's very like urban and everything. But still, like, you know, that aside, as far as the way they did it and the fact that you know everything looks like you want it to look. Right. You know, in terms of like no nothing is confusing and nothing gets your attention too much away from right. the gameplay. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I do appreciate like these little lighting gradients that they have oh, yeah. in, in areas, you know. It adds so much uh, richness and, um, um, but in a safe, uh, non confetti syndrome way. And oh, ambiance is what I was going to say, like atmosphere. The memory despair and the colors. Yeah, yeah, you could not do stuff like that uh, very easily at all on something like the Mega Drive because you'd run out of memory and color indexes way before uh, you were done with a nice smooth lighting effect gradient like that. You pretty much have only about eight values or something, in, you know, dark right. to light. And that's if you want to use up eight whole values on a uh, background gradient instead of right. reserving it for uh, just more variety in your backgrounds and character sprites because the Mega Drive had four 16 color palettes that could be used for any one thing. So any tile in the background could use any of the palettes, I think, and any uh, sprite could use any of those palettes. Right. Yeah, you have to get a little creative lower, you know, color bit depth, yeah, and kind of shift around the spectrum <laughs> some to get yeah. uh, more subtle gradients and things like that for Mega Drive, but exactly. I, I don't know, I guess Neo Geo had a full... Oh, not not 24-bit, but huge. I can't remember. Right. Like, at least 16-bit color range or something yeah. like that, as far as... I'll put up an informatic uh, pop-up in the video, in the editing, to remember exactly. But right. I'm pretty sure it was somewhere in the ballpark of what the Super Nintendo's color palette was capable of. Right. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think it was in the tens of thousands. Um, okay. Yeah, it seems close to that uh, yeah. from what I can see here. But, uh, yeah. Whereas the Mega Drive had fi uh, 512 possible colors to pick from for your to make your four pallets of 16. Right. Uh, whereas the Super Nintendo had something like 40 or 60,000 colors to choose from, and then quite a bit more, I can't remember how many, but way more than four uh, 16 color pallets to distribute right. things from. And then Neo Geo was absolutely absurd. <laughs> it's tons of 16 color pallets out of a really nice uh, color fidelity. Wow. This, yeah, really I would say a lot of the OGO games probably didn't even use all of them. Probably not, no. yeah. It's very frustrating when this boss gets you in his attack sequence and you seem kind of helpless for several... Maybe your log move? It's probably that's what the log move is for, but I don't oh, remember yeah. how to do it. I think it's just all four together. Yeah, so if he starts doing the attack sequence and you feel stuck, try the log move. Right. Ooh! 
Ooh, a super complex, uh, super suplex to the uh, boss. That was gratifying. Yeah, you had asked earlier in a uh, previously uh, failed recording attempt um, uh, of this game if there were only three levels in the game, because oh, yeah. when you start, there's only three um, countries to choose from. But I do remember that one time that I played through quite a bit of the game, that and in later like readings about the game, I think, and maybe watching some long plays or let's plays, that I think it takes about 40 minutes to an hour to beat. So there's definitely more than um, three levels, which I think we've gone through more than three levels already. Uh, uh, but uh, we'll see if there's any additional countries. Maybe there's only three countries, but several levels per country. Uh, right. I think that's the case. Big guy. Yeah. Could not remember to do all four buttons and get out of that. I'm not even sure. <laughs> all right, so you have a little flashing blue ball in your meter, so that yeah. probably means there's a special move or the log move that you can do. <laughs> Drop a log on the boss there. He hates it when you do that. This guy's doing enough damage. Where feel like yeah I don't I don't want to think he's the last boss that he might be I don't know yeah no he I remember he's not right um okay. what was I going to say the, um, <laughs> something about this game it'll come back to me as we're playing later oh yeah that guy that boss's name translates directly to token eater <laughs> right. oh that's right he becomes a, an ally in the story, and I think he might even become selectable. I might be hallucinating that, but th certainly that's been done in many other slash em ups and beat em ups in the past. But um, yeah, so he he's helping us right now. So I think I remember controlling him at some point, but that could be a total misremembering. I don't love the any alias font for the text box. Yeah, not at all. Me neither. Uh, combined with that dither, it's you're just yeah. Why bother anti-aliasing that much, especially oh, yeah. back then? Very cool. Go ahead and pick him if you'd like to. Uh, uh, wherever he is. I guess he's on your side. I yeah, I can't even tell. I guess it's this you, guy. Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah we'll check the new ones. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so there's they've introduced a new country. They probably did that before, and I just didn't even notice. But there you go, more simulated uh, translucent water baked right into the tile set, the animated tile set. Awesome. Nice uh, um, sub-pixel animation in this guy's robe on his idle animation, with the wind going through his robe. I'll yeah. hold still for a second so that everyone can see that. Nice toads. Reminds me of Damon Claw. <laughs> Very much. Ooh. This I've got to say this is annoying though. Lining up with toads and you're slamming at different attack buttons and your character's attacking above them. Yeah. The... If that should not be possible at all, either make me automatically do a low attack or you let me press down an attack to do a low attack. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. Um, some games compensate for yep. small enemies, and the, yeah, they make you. Like they would do a kick or something. Yeah, exactly. But it's... Um, Golden Axe comes to mind with the uh, thief, uh, whatever they are, gnomes or imps or whatever, that you right. kick to get the um, spells from and the uh, health pickups, I think. I guess the, the weapon hits them easier or something. Or yeah, something. yeah, this is a nice attack that attacks low and up at the same time. But yeah, in uh, Metro Siege as well, there is a specific low attack that you can do. Actually, a few low attack options. 
Alright, I have to find my jump button. Suddenly platforming. Yep. So you can see there, this is a great example, that fire. Where the fire is all red and doesn't overlap the background tiles, it's faking translucency by coloring the brick red also. But then where it overlaps the dark colors, they just dither into it. Uh, and I suppose... Oh, it's still a tile animation. Look, that fire doesn't overlap my toe. I was gonna say, I'm surprised they couldn't use more color on the fire to blend it into the background better. Instead right. of the dithering. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I would assume that... I mean, like, if I were doing this, and I had all those colors to spare, yeah. basically palettes and stuff, I could easily find a good in-between. Yeah, exactly. If I needed something. Just like they did with the water, so... Yeah, because that's really harsh. It's almost like the artist assumed that the fire was going to be able to overlap the players, because yeah. that's the one valid reason, very valid reason to do it, especially back in the day when this was made of CRT monitors. That dither would look far less noticeable, and it would look much more like translucent fire blending it in. Um, yeah. But now on modern LCDs, I wouldn't suggest doing that, especially if it is just animated oh. tiles that go under or behind the player in Z order. Right. But like, look on the wall there, you can't go in behind that fire. So the fact that it's got such a harsh dither, instead of using one or two other colors to blend it in better, like it could look really nice uh, if they used another color index instead of uh, just doing such a harsh dither. But again, keep in mind, whenever you're critiquing pixel art made back in the day, even the artists were, like, LCD monitors didn't exist, basically. Uh, or right. were more poor visual quality than using a CRT monitor. So, pixel artists back in the day were using, um, basically, CRT monitors or TVs on their development systems. So it was designed on and for that specific um, monitor style, which includes that built-in blurriness that blends dithering and blends colors together quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, even monitors, well, I guess it depends on the, the time frame yeah. you're talking about, but monitors get, could get pretty high quality as far as, like, you know, more so than a, a TV or a lower quad quality older monitor. Yeah, exactly. So I guess it, w it, it would depend on, like, the studio's budget, budget and, and, and yeah. what they're willing to do. Um, and what year it was, like you said. Yeah. It really depends. They had to work with wow. That, kind of stuff. Yeah, that was cool. So My character just summoned a demon to uh, get oh, a few oh. attacks out. That's a really cool attack. Very cool. The, I, like, even though these enemies are, are neat to see... I, I don't like, like their visual... Yeah, yeah, yeah they're, they're, they just end they, up looking like blobs. Like, it feels like yeah. this was a, a, a lower budget uh, thing, you know? Like, yeah. It, it's one of those things where the concept was good, but the art, it, it looks too cartoony. It's too much of just an amorphous blob. Like, to me, um, a pinnacle of a design like that was the Quintessons from the original Transformers the movie, which had right. I, either three or four faces. Um, going around like an egg shape, robotic, different robotic faces with different personalities. And that looked really cool. I think if they had reduced it to fewer masks and they were better drawn um, and less cartoony, uh, it would look way cooler. Yeah, I mean... I suppose it, it feels like something that should be used more sparingly and more special. But, yeah. but the fact that they're using them over and over makes it, like, you start noticing that. It's like, oh, I'm yeah. just hitting a, you know, a blob. <laughs> yeah, they look kind of like al albino turds <laughs> with, right. uh, with silly faces drawn on them yeah. um, to be as harsh as possible. Yeah, not a fan. Note to self, splice in an image of the Quintessons uh, while I'm editing this video. <laughs> I guess it is Japan, so... I'll say. They often uh, go into the bazaar, which I, yeah. I appreciate. You know? 
Uh, oh. Snake. Yeah. I like the no, toads. It's, it's like we're in such a. I remember talking about the urban environments earlier. And it's yeah. like we're in such a totally different world now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to me, I, I don't feel like the quality of art is as good in this level. It feels much flatter. There's much less yeah. sense of depth. Um, and they're trying to pull off the illusion of a lot of depth. Like, that looks like it's supposed to be some kind of stepped pyramid. Like, I can't remember if it's Aztec or Incan. Look at that. Look, it looks like a tiny, it looks like we're in a mini golf uh, park. Yeah. And that's a little structure there. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean? Part of it's, I guess they wanted so much open ground here to walk all the way up here, but it does feel. Yeah. But the Neo Geo has the power to parallax it. You could have pushed that into the background with the colors and parallaxed it. Like, to me, this is like an amazing drop in visual quality and technical quality. It, yeah, and, and really, yeah, that kind of blurry ground it's a little yeah it looks cheap it just looks filtered procedurally yeah. done it's like oh we finally have like photoshop uh seven or whatever whatever it was back then photoshop four and um it's starting to um yeah i noticed creep in elements like that in the previous levels but yeah I, more tastefully worked, done i guess it worked a little better yeah yep yeah. yeah keep that in mind here. Yeah, keep that in mind, people. When you're a production artist, there's no such thing as a cheat that is not acceptable to get something done faster. So long as the quality is good, and so long as that cheat isn't literally stealing something from another artist or a photographer or something, or another game or something. But, like, when, when other tools came into existence that could create graphics with filters, 3D modeling ahead of time and rendering it out and cleaning it up, all that's fine, it's fair game. The goal was to make the best looking game possible and all of the animations and art you need to within the time and money budget. Uh, so it's not like these days a lot of pixel artists exist that have the uh, benefit of incredibly advanced tools, no time schedule, no deadlines, no budget, um, and, and infinite memory and infinite colors to use. So uh, keep that in mind when you're judging um, games like this, that everything was done within severe time constraints and budget and technical constraints as well. Yeah, there are elements here that I like, but it doesn't yeah. feel like it comes together well enough. I, I think part of what's missing on this ground is it's just flat yes. and it doesn't scale at all. Exactly. It's just no gradation of the value. Exactly. Distance, it just, yeah. It's literally the same filtered texture going up, up, and up when that's supposed to be represent distance and depth. And just like you pointed out how nice it was, there was that lighting gradient in that urban uh, city sidewalk street right. level. Now yeah, you've was, got yeah, none of that at all. And it wouldn't have been that difficult either. Right, no, not at all. Say. I, th I just think the the budget uh, and the time constraints got the better of this level and it's very possible that this level was um, assigned to an artist that was not a great environment artist or the same artist maybe had a lot less time um, or it could even be they were running out of memory uh, back then uh, memory was very expensive even for arcade and neo geo and to keep price down maybe they were like oh well you know we need to use a repeating ground texture tile more um yeah they had they had this who knows big, yeah. uh, bird phoenix bird thing <laughs> and uh they were like well we don't yeah. have any more uh yeah. to go around exactly Yeah, I really wish my jump button weren't so inconveniently mapped <laughs> right now. This, this feels very different compared to all the other bosses we've fought. Yeah, that's for sure. Just flying something. Whereas when we were playing uh, King of Dragons, like they yeah. made flying enemies kind of work, or like, yeah. air enemies and stuff. But even though that was a much simpler yeah. Less impressive game, I suppose, as far as a much older game, I guess. Right. But yeah, it definitely had a sense of cohesiveness to the overall um, designs and gameplay and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and I've got to say, too, like, 
a thing like a phoenix is much more in keeping with dragons and more mythical things. Whereas in this case, things until then stayed much more humanoid even when they were demons and ghosts. Right. So the phoenix did just seem more out of place. A little more outlandish and cartoony. Yeah, I mean this isn't... This is just... This was just crafted as a game, right? Or is this this isn't based on anything? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think it's based on a particular anime series or manga or anything. Um, yeah, because like if it is, I mean, yeah. you know, like maybe it would make sense to have that other. Thing right, in if there it was in the, the exactly. But it, it does feel like like now we're back fighting the zombie, you know, guys yeah. or whatever. So. Yeah. Back and forth. Through. I thought for sure the ground was going to collapse and we were going to fall. Right. We've played so many games that does that. It's a great trope. It's very effective. It's fun. Um, but yeah, that, that was huge in the 16-bit days. There were even a lot of Mega Drive games that did that. Yeah, this is the way the levels scroll back and forth while you're playing. Uh, yep. You know, with Obviously, the Neo Geo's sort of limited resolution and the 4x3 aspect. Like, this is a yeah. game that could benefit from just opening up to like a 16x9, you know? Uh, right. Quite a bit, I think. I'm gonna be the big guy again if I can remember which icon is oh, him. I, I oh, you are him. Oh, yeah, never yeah. mind. Right, I'll be the knight. But yeah, I, I had started to mention uh, that for a long time I didn't give uh, Dragon Ball Z a chance because, like, I was more into the what you would call more cool manga art styles, I guess. Right. But the uh, Dragon, uh, no, not Dragon Ball. I'm sorry, uh, One Piece. Um, and then, um, but once I gave One Piece a chance, there was so much flexibility and freedom within that cartoony art style. That, like, that's the thing about that series that you come to appreciate is the crazy range of creativity in the uh, different story arcs and in between the different characters. There's a really massive uh, design and personality range and like their different sub subplots and backstories and stuff. So what it lacks in um, that kind of cool factor until you get used to it of the visual style, it makes up for it in the just kind of breathtaking amounts of creativity. Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of good about both that and yeah. I think your machine Naruto as yeah. well. Uh, and it's, you know, like I said, it's one of those things maybe at some point, you know, yeah. like in the... Retirement. <laughs> exactly. And when, I, yeah. when I've not got like a bunch of games to make and <laughs> yeah, stuff exactly. like that, but um, yeah, I can always appreciate creatives of these properties really yeah. care and, and keep it creative and fresh despite yeah. you know these things can go on running forever you know yeah sometimes. yeah i don't know what it was about naruto it wasn't the art style in that case that i didn't give it a chance for the long time longest time but it was so popular already when i had heard of it that i got kind of a pokemon vibe for it like it was created purely for marketing <laughs> So I just didn't give it um, a chance for the longest time. But again, if you avoid, if you use a filler list and just watch the real canon uh, episodes, it's, some of the story arcs are fantastic. Um, and it does uh, it gets even better into the uh, second uh, season, not season, second series called uh, Shippuden, uh, Naruto Shippuden. Um, and kind of like Dragon, uh, the Dragon Ball uh, series of series, you go from watching the first character as a kid, then they grow up, then they have a kid. So like the f the next series is focusing on the child now instead of the father. So Naruto does the same thing now with the uh, continuing uh, series called Baruto, which is his son. Um, so. Uh, so far, I'm not digging Baruto as much as the Naruto series, but it's not bad. 
But I think also the the original creator might have less to do with this series now. I think he kind of handed over most of the writing and production to uh, probably his best, longest intern or, you know, like, you know yeah, what I mean? That's, like, that's always noticeable uh, when, you know, yeah. the original person. But, you know, I that happens after a while, yeah. you know. I think that happens that happened with the Mega Man series after a yep. while of games you know like the original guy was like yep. okay I think it was somewhere in the, the X series along the way he yep. was just like okay I'm done I'm moving yep. on and I think that's why that fell apart yeah like, you know like yep. as a franchise or that particular uh, version yep. of Mega Man but yeah yeah by the way amazing use of parallax yeah. on these puddles usually you only see the parallax in an actual back layer like, you know, the city in the background and stuff like that. But this was just such a creative use to literally keep in mind what they had to do was there's a back layer also created in sprites because everything on the Neo Geo is sprites. So they have the back layer, but it's obscured like 80 or 90 percent. And instead of using it in the sky area, they cut out these negative space holes in the ground in the shapes of puddles to show through this inverted back layer that is the reflection of what you would be able to see if the screen could scroll up higher into the distance so it's it's a way of creating an amazing effect and um, adding parallax and giving you more information about the environment that you're in without showing it directly very nice very clever and the raindrops in the puddle just it, that last little um, touch so I wish the contrast in the art were a little darker, so it looked more dirty, puddly. It's a little too crisp, in my opinion. Like the effect would be even more perfect if, but it was still amazingly a great idea and quite well executed. Yeah, I think without that, it would have looked weird. I think it is kind of odd not seeing like where that road ends or something or, or any kind right. of horizon line. Like it just kind of goes to the top. Yeah. But I, I guess that is in, in line with most of the, a lot of the other levels yep. where it just has that angle to it, and then, you know. Right. And once again, look at that water from that. It does, they did not do a good job with it because they relied entirely on the fake translucent effects, like right. pre-baked in. Like it doesn't look like water. It looks like transparent light blue. Yeah, um, it needs more uh, white, frothy. Exactly. Yeah. And then, of course, it needs to be spreading out on the ground. They needed to transition into big puddles up there. Right. Uh, because we're, there's a giant amount of water pluming out, and it's just not accumulating on the ground directly yeah. where it's sitting. This is great use of the animated uh, fake transparent water on the ground here. Right, yeah. Oh. See ya. How'd you do Still, it? That's the question. I, I don't know. Yeah. It might be like a double tap of both buttons or right. something like that. Or holding it down too long or something. Yeah, like I said, everyone, we're going to link in the description to a really nice, thorough explanation of how to do all the moves and all that stuff. One other minor gripe I have about this game that I noticed is when enemies are dead, they have quite a long idle before death and then death animation, where you could quite easily think they not know they're dead yet and waste your time standing there slashing a dead enemy, or slashing at, waiting for them to stand up or get up. Yeah, um, they do that, like, melt, uh, or yeah, whatever, exactly. melt away. Yeah, I agree, like, it, it's more the timing than it is the animation, I suppose, yep. but yeah. Yeah, like they sit there in a state that looks like they could get right back up for quite a while before they do their death animation. Right. So either go right into the death or do a more drastic color change or make them flicker before they do their death animation. So it's more obvious that... Um, that's a nice gameplay mechanic, the way they shoot the two fireballs or ghost uh, spirit balls or whatever at you. And you can carefully walk in between in a kind of... Z depth sense. Did you notice yeah. that? 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was nice. I'm always... I keep forgetting that the bombs... Like, ah. They're just a power-up that you pick up. Yeah. Instead... But I keep thinking they're gonna explode. <laughs> yeah, 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 me too, yeah. <laughs> and, well, especially because, ironically, they flicker before they go away. Right. And that can make you think, oh crap, it's about to blow up. No, it's just about to disappear. Turn around. <laughs> Even the frogs do, like, the melt uh, yep. death or whatever. Yep, they had the memory to spare, so they have some pretty extravagant death animations. Yeah. And for all the enemies. Which, I, you gotta hand it to them, it was uh, a lot of extra work and memory, so they had uh, quite a bit of budget if they could spend a lot of it just on fancy death animations for every last character. Or enemy, at least. Very high budget game, very high quality. Yeah, for any artist or pixel artist like interested in characters and character design, it's it. a great uh, game to watch. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I'm sure See, there's there's, yep. there's like slightly better flowing water yep. there, you know, a little bit. Yeah, it's less gushing, so right. even the same technique would look less of more okay and less bad but also their brightest highlight color is more bright right. so it looks more naturally like water so it's got those two things going for it they still didn't go quite far enough with um you know you can't just rely on that okay now i'm going to do another layer in the painting program of translucent like you need to hand pixel in some much more opaque kind of frothy water going on especially at the lip where it transitions from flowing horizontally to flowing downward like a waterfall at the top edge there's always a little bit of uh, aeration in the water from that turbulence of the high speed change in angle and stuff and then especially where the water hits the other water um, not every aspect of it has to have the translucent effect it can look more opaque to pull off the complete effect but again, this is a matter of budget and how much time they could spend on this any one thing. So super easy to criticize, but for any team, even a big team, to pull off a game of this overall caliber in visuals, gameplay, music, sound, I mean, this is the cream of the crop. So, you know what I mean? Yeah, and we, of course we can't help but uh, talk about these things anyways. Yeah. And on our own games and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And keep in mind, everyone, whenever we criticize any game, no matter how good it is or bad, it's not to crap on other games to feel better about ourselves or that we're delusional and we think our games will be better in every way or not have some of the same issues that we talk about. But having these discussions and these hopefully con constructive criticism discussions, it's about um, learning more about and teaching more about the different things to keep in mind and uh, pitfalls to potentially avoid in the first place to save time and potentially money and to save yourself from having to redo something if you have the luxury of having the time to redo something like confetti syndrome in general and these tricks like keeping large areas monochromatic once you know about them from anywhere or from these discussions we're having you can make better decisions in the first place to avoid confetti syndrome and other problems the first time you start designing your art instead of learning the hard way from trial and error. Yeah, it's all a good, healthy exercise for creativity, yeah. you know, and yeah. uh, building your skills and everything. So. Yeah. This guy is definitely a heavy damage guy. Yeah. So. You killed my brother, Token Eater. I will have my revenge. <laughs> I am Dollar Muncher. Right. He's, he's ending blocker. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I wonder now how much farther there is in that. I don't think I made it to this part that first time I played through to just see more of the game. So I have no idea how much more we have to go. But I did start to say before that... Um, a common problem with many genres, but also beat em ups and slash em ups, is too many of the enemies can be beat by lining up and button mashing, and um, virtually all of them can be. 
And then the game, once it gets past a half hour, there's a huge risk of things starting to feel more monotonous. And I hate that feeling of even with the really high quality games, um, even with Streets of, Streets of Rage 2, especially since I played it so many times, but especially Streets of Rage 3, the reason I almost always, or one of the big reasons, I almost always opt to play Streets of Rage 2 instead of 3, is it's a shorter game with, I think, better balanced gameplay. And far too often with many games, including Streets of Rage 3, you might start to play it going, yeah, I want to play this game, I'll have fun. But after the half hour point, you start feeling like, Ugh, like how much longer is this? And you feel like you no longer want to beat the game because you're having fun, but you want to beat the game because you'll feel like, well, I've already played for a half hour. I'll have wasted all of this time if I don't tough it through and keep playing, even though I'm kind of bored and beat the game. Which I think part of it too, even you know, even if you put the the length of the whole experience aside, mm. it can also be just how much time you're spending on one thing. Like we fought yes. that guy for long enough where it felt like okay, yep. you know, um, yep. you know, there's not much to look at there. It's the same guy. He's doing the same patterns over and over, and it, you know what I mean. Like it, it didn't change much throughout the whole fight, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, that those things matter a lot too when it comes to the game feeling Absolutely. its length or not you know exactly the more you literally make the player repeat themselves over and over again and you're not kind of refreshing their palette so to speak by changing right. the environment changing the enemies changing the music changing the gameplay style like oh with this enemy i can't button mash because he has a built-in counter i have to like that's what they should have been doing is right. introducing like forcing the player to stay on their toes and go, oh, I need to counterattack this boss. Like, I can't just right. line up with them and button mash. I mean, he was a he was a cool boss. Yeah, yeah. But he was, like, he was the first one that I felt, other than maybe the flying bird. Thing, <laughs> yes, the phoenix. Where, where it, just, yeah. it started to feel like he, he was just getting cheap shots on us. There was no, yeah. like, not tons of damage. It, yeah. it wasn't about our skill, it was just about yeah. restart, respawning over and over again. Yeah. You know? This is a nice Yeah. Yeah, and I, I didn't get the chance to mention it. For the intro to this level, there were rays of light, um, affectionately called God Rays, um, in uh, art in general. These rays of light uh, casting down from the sky. And once again, that was baked in. Um, it wasn't the uh, Neo Geo on the fly calculating new colors to create these translucent colors. It just built right into the background graphics. Uh, but it was very nicely done. But you could yeah, see I now in. Yep, go ahead. I do think, like, the slashing and the effects, like, like the yeah. controls of it, the effects of it, and the sound effects that happen, all of that is very gratifying in yeah. this game. You know? Yeah, I agree. The uh, the motion blurs on a lot of the sword swings are downright beautiful. Like this knight guy, I think they're a purple color when I get out like his big special uh, attack, which I haven't done in a long time. And it's they're using the flickering sprite trick for the sense of translucency. And it works really well and looks really beautiful. They used great looking shapes and texture and colors for those effects. Um, but once again, you notice they didn't flicker the fire there on those torches that can overlap us. Right. So when you look at them, um, they drew in, built into the animation, the translucency of the fire. So you could see the back of the uh, metal cage that holds it, the metal basket in the fire, but then if you walk behind the fire, it's not transparent at all. So they could have done a combination of the top of the fire, or even all of the fire, using the flickering method. And then it would have looked better, because then you would have seen the player through it a little bit too. I think the trick with this fire is that they chose colors that were bright enough and hot enough, yep. where 
they would generally look brighter than almost anything behind them. Yep. So it, it kind of works. And yep. You're not focusing on it too much, you know? You'll also notice they did a very interesting choice with the texture. That's a very oddly vertical fire animation. But that reduces any temptation or need for a traditional checkerboard dither pattern. Right. Right? Because it's almost vertically dithering itself just by the very texture that they designed the fire to have and animate it. So again, like that really feels like one of the really more experienced game artists worked on that asset. Right. Yeah, I agree. Because it's really masterfully done. And it's very possible they did these they designed these levels in sequential order. And maybe the artist got to see the dithered fire in game, in action, in the environment and was like, mm, there's probably a better way to do that, and adapted his art style uh, accordingly. So, like, artists learn as they, even within a single game, especially a game like this, I'm sure it took a long development time. Yeah, I would assume, yeah. Yeah, so that's the thing, like, an artist can get noticeably better in the course of making one game, and then the question is, is there enough time and budget in the game for them to go back and improve some of the stuff they made earlier on when they were less skilled or less knowledgeable or both right well that's kind of like how you know the sequels were back then because this is the third one of these right yes uh, so yes. like i don't know i can't speak to the quality of the other two maybe you can but yeah. uh you know that was often how it worked that sequel yeah. was usually like a better incarnation yeah uh, same game usually <laughs> except for rastan rastan 2 was an yeah. embarrassment to video games throughout human history um i'll splice in some footage of rastan 1 and then the beautiful rastan saga compared to rastan 2 which uh they seem to be ashamed enough to rename it to nastars uh nastar i think in uh, at least in american arcades but man that thing is a monstrosity um <laughs> i had never seen it i remember you showed it to me yeah. for the first time when we did that for it well exactly it, or, or about rest in three but i can't yeah. imagine any arcade owner back then would have seen that thing playing or a videotape of it and ordered that arcade machine you know what i mean so it's amazing i ever saw i don't know if i ever saw it in the was arcade it? i think okay, i did so it was only an arcade then yeah I, I don't think there was ever a, a port. Why would there be two consoles? But uh, it was definitely an arcade game. Right. And it was horrifically bad looking and playing. <laughs> it was so different, too. I mean, they sort of had a nice formula. It seemed like yeah. the first game. I don't know why you wouldn't just enhance and build on that. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing about the Sengoku series... Uh, I get the feeling it feels like it was completely different teams. So to me, I don't know if I read this and now I'm pretending or fooling myself into thinking I'm coming up with this as a theory, but it feels to me like it's completely different teams and they may have just named this game Sengoku 3 since the Sengoku 1 and 2 maybe did well enough that it warranted branding this as the third one. Right. But as far as, I mean, they were all beat-em-up style games. Well, this, I mean, the... So, but the quality like it's, and the did aesthetic. They have the same characters no, the not at all. Oh, no. Wow. Okay. Uh, the first two, especially the first one, was super hokey, super eighties, campy, uh, much more western themed. Um, like there was a ninja character in the first or the second one, but it was much more like I I vaguely remember like goofy looking American Hollywood movie style guys in like midriff exposing 80s fashion um That's interesting. and like yeah it was just really compared to sengoku 3 it lacked all of the class and replaced it with camp yeah so yeah giant giant jump in cool factor and overall quality between one and two uh either of the first two and the third one I don't remember distinctly how different this, the second and first were from each other. Um, I know they were quite different from each other, but this third one just seems like a... I would guess it's a whole other team uh, and game designer. But like I said, sometimes people just get much better over time working on games, so... It's possible it's the same team or a lot of the same team, and they just really matured. Yeah. 
And over time, I think it just got more and more affordable for them to make bigger and bigger capacity Neo Geo cartridges and arcade machines. So, you know, even if your skill stays the same, if you can use more and more memory, you can have smoother animations and uh, more effects on screen and all that stuff. Oh yeah. So. <laughs> it would make it a a sensible financial decision <laughs> to buy the Neo Geo back then, which was very expensive in its own right. Right. But trying to beat this game in the arcade, you, you might be halfway there to buying an entire <laughs> Neo Geo and the game cartridge, which was probably uh, I don't know, two hundred bucks back then, hundred and fifty or something like that. Yeah, I remember that was they were one super of the expensive. I stayed away from that system back then and I was yeah. just way priced out of my range. Yeah, know? exactly. I like, wow, I can't. I mean, if, it was awesome. I, of course yeah. I wanted one, but you know. I think when it was on my radar and like being advertised in video game magazines, I'm pretty sure the retail price for the console itself was 600 US dollars and then every cartridge was like one to three hundred dollars depending right. on the game. So yeah, that was just ridiculously outside of uh, uh, my budget back then, or my entire family's budget. Yeah. Oh. But yeah, I love this guy's uh, dash move with button A. A nice batter up swing. Yeah. Like, that's such an important aspect of gameplay design and how it ties into character design. You've got a big guy with a big weapon that's a clobbering implement. Give them a move that really lets you vis viscerally feel that and see that. And see the reaction of the enemies getting sent flying. Absolutely, yeah. No, I just cancelled out of my attack sequence with a dash. That was nice. So now that we're hopefully almost done with the game, the um, I'm starting to learn some of the nuance of the game mechanic. Like I said, everyone, sorry we're not uh, doing this game justice gameplay-wise. Hopefully the conversation is interesting for all of you um, interested in these elements of um, pixel art and gameplay design. Yeah, it's uh, in endless uh, zombie... Yeah, I feel like yeah, I feel like we've been seeing these guys since level one. Pretty much. So yeah, that's another thing we talk about themes and not um, making sure you keep the player surprised visually and gameplay wise throughout the game, so it doesn't start feeling really redundant and and repetitive. And they had enough visually distinct enemies in this game; they could have held back and stopped using the same enemy uh, so much later in the game. Like, in other words, there's enough variety in the game that they didn't have to keep reusing it over and over again. I think we've already defeated 50 of them or something. I feel it's more like 100. <laughs> or 100, yeah, in this last yes. portion here. When I edit... It's, it's literally the same guy over and yeah. over again. When I edit this video, I am not going to take the time to count them all. So if there's anyone with right. way too much time on their hand, feel free to comment in the video and let us know how many of those blue zombie guys we uh, killed throughout this game. And there's not enough of these... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Guys. Well, that is a good worth mentioning. Um, one of the most easy tricks back in the day, because we're talking about how there's, like in the case of the Mega Drive and in the Neo Geo even more, different 16 color palettes that you can use for any object, you could use the same sprite with the same art graphics and say, okay, now this sprite, instead of using the first set of 16 colors, is going to use the second or the third set of 16. And if you've carefully arranged those palettes to be arranged the same way, certain ranges from light to dark, like what could be skin tones in this set, and so on and so forth, all you do is point the same enemy art into the new palette and you can create a different looking enemy that is just what you would call an alternate palette version of that enemy 
And then if you tweak the AI so the enemy also behaves a bit differently, you get a ton of mileage from the same artwork, uh, which is great for development time and for memory, and helps keep things fresh. So I, I'm, cert I'm almost certain the first time we saw this, this is the same female ninja character enemy that I said I wasn't too fond of. But her color scheme is much nicer now. It's less gaudy. Yeah, like, back then you would see, like, RPG games take advantage of that a lot because, yep. you know, they would have to, you know, they'd have to come up with, they'd have to fit, like, you know, 200 enemies or right. something, even though, though it was a still image sometimes on right. this cartridge. And, yeah, they would do that and get mileage, and usually in an RPG they would change the enemy some. It's like, oh, this one's got different spells or something, which right, is Right, exactly. To do. But you didn't see it as much in these, like, beat em up style games and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, you would see color changes, but their behavior seems identical, uh, or you would see... Um... The only one that really stands out to me that did that a lot was, were, like, the Ninja Turtles games, because they had those yep. foot guys. Yeah, foot, sh foot it, soldiers. Yeah, foot soldiers. And it, yeah. it felt like... It felt a little cheap there, yeah. to be honest. Like, like they would just do oh, yeah, of course. versions. And it was... I mean, it, it worked, you know? But that's yeah. the only time I can remember in these style games where it was done quite right. a lot, and maybe overdone there. Yeah, but, exactly. You know. Yeah, and uh, like that's the cool thing is you can do things beyond just the color change. You could do the color change, and then even with like most of these old systems, they used tile-based graphics even for the sprites. So everything was broken up, broken up on a grid into like eight by eight pixel chunks. So you could change which chunks are displaying the head or something like that. So you could do a color change for the body and maybe give it a different head or give, give the character a different weapon. And like I said, change the, the AI. And then you're really getting some really nice variety without a lot of additional memory or work. Right. But if you're just changing the colors and you're not really severely changing the behavior and you're doing it a ton, that is technically and literally cheap it's good for them it's good you know especially creating like a, a super nintendo or genesis cartridge was quite expensive and you needed to keep the price down and you couldn't make gigantic multi hundred dollar co uh, cartridges like for the neo geo because that wasn't your target market um yeah so i think, they, uh, yeah. I think these color swaps are doing more damage though which is the only difference right but um yeah yeah that's not yeah, enough in is, my opinion this is feeling like the the refight all bosses uh, thing yeah. for sure and this was like this was like the first or second boss yeah yeah, so like that's our philosophy making uh going into designing both Damon Claw and Metro Siege we want the games, our games, to not overstay their welcome, and the value isn't based on how long it takes to beat it the first time or anyone sit through, it's how fun is it, and how many days in a row, or how many times maybe even in the same day, do you want to play the game? Like, I'd much rather play a game like this, and it take like 20 minutes or a half hour to get all the way through once you're skilled, and it's fun the whole way through, and you might want to play it later that same day because it stayed fun the whole time, and it didn't eat up your whole day, like, beating it because you feel like otherwise you lost time, you know, like you wasted time. Um, so, like, we really focus, instead of spending our... You know, we don't have a literal budget for the game, but time is money, so to speak, and we're spending a lot of time making these games. But we're focusing our time on really making sure that what is there in gameplay and in levels and in enemies is really fun, instead of just making a ton of content and never having that time. Keep in mind, every new thing you add takes gameplay testing not only for fun factor but especially also for bugs so the more no matter how much budget and time you have for your game keep that decision making in your mind is it more worth it to keep adding more stuff on top or is it worth it getting new play testers that never played before so are a much better ju uh, judge of the fun factor and especially the um the difficulty curve of the game because 
you you keep testing your game as you make it or you have the same playtesters the whole way through you all become god level by the time the game isn't even halfway done being made and then you're all terrible the judges of uh the difficulty level of your game um and that's really been a curse of several games even some i've seen in recent history i won't name names but uh uh, I did a review of a fairly modern retro pixel art game that I think really suffered from that. Right. Like, great looking game, um, uh, and had tons of potential, but just, to me, it's difficulty range, uh, it was frustrating for, you know, not in a fun way. Um, right, yeah, I think that's, like, like you were saying about, you know, there is... Like, you know, we we can eventually reach ah. the point of having, you know, more budget and possibly bigger right. games and things like that. But yeah. like you were saying, regardless of that, if, if you achieve that, you still have to sort of make those tough decisions about yeah. the scale of your project, you know, and, and how focused it needs to be based yeah. on what you're trying to make, you know. Um, right. Like, imagine this game, but, you know you have like 10 playable characters or 12 playable characters instead of this right. small handful that they've got it would start to feel overwhelming you're like oh wow like, right. who do i be i can't even i can't even decide you know like you get right. to that that screen and suddenly you're selecting you right. don't even know who you pick and all right. your friends over there dying <laughs> you know right. the, uh, but um and the other important thing is yeah. as you arrive at that level of things you're offering whether it be whole other characters or powers the difference between any one of them becomes less and less exactly. and it becomes less and less meaningful to have that variety i think even though it's one of the greatest games ever made super metroid and uh, castlevania symphony of the night uh both fall into that where suddenly it's like there are so many powers and power combinations like in super metroid that like really do I, it reminds me of the difference between sim city and sim city 2000 where it's like do i really want to be focusing on the plumbing work under the city as well that that's really fun in this view where you can't see the city anymore yeah you're, exactly you're, you're not just looking at basically a dark background yeah exactly so you can and again keep in mind every character every playable character you add more gameplay testing more bug fixing and You've, you've been able to spend less of that time perfecting and refining the gameplay that was already there and making sure the difference in play, gameplay style between the already existing selectable characters is as varied and different as possible. Right. So I call that Christmas list style of game, de game design. Where it's like, oh, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and this feature's cool, and this feature's too. And it is a giant curse to most, most very passionate but beginner. This sounds like a boss fight to me. Yeah. And looks like it. So, yeah, oh yeah. I'm assuming so. But, yeah, don't let that... If you want to get into game designing, or if you already are, don't get bit by that uh, curse. Don't... Don't you fall start, into Christmas start, list right. game design. You, you have to start very focused and then build on that premise. Yes. That, like central thing that you're going for. Yep. Um, if the thing that makes your game special is it has even more features than all the other AAA games before it, that should send giant alarms in your head. That is a problem. Figure out what specific thing or two make your game special and hone and oh, wow. perfect the hell. This is Mega Token Eater. Yeah. <laughs> this is Bank Account Destroyer. Right. This is Gambling Addict in the Casino <laughs> level of... Uh... But see, like, if every boss had been a big guy like this, this yep. guy wouldn't make the impact he does. Exactly. He's like the only guy that's giant, so it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, no, he definitely has the wow factor. He's well designed, he, uh, he's big, he's got cool magical effects. Uh, it almost excuses the, the uh, fact that he's a super unfair token eater. Yeah, it's, it's a cheap move uh, yeah. that he's got there. But then again, uh, I suck at playing so I can't, <laughs> I can't blame all of this on, on him. I think he's completely invulnerable during that magic state too. 
Yeah, it just becomes uh, a, a sequence of dodging those things. Yep. Pretty much at that point, while also fighting humans. That's pretty cool, though. Like I'm, I'm getting into accidental parry uh, duels with the boss. So it didn't seem to benefit me in any way, other than I didn't get hit by his attack. But uh, still cool. Well, yeah, and since this is the end, I assume, of the game, I should mention, too, a while back when we were talking, I was clobbering a barrel over and over again with my giant character fighting with a tree trunk, and that barrel took forever to destroy. And I think I mentioned that in our previous recording attempt and not in this one, but that's a an inherently not gratifying thing about this game. Again, it's a minor nitpick. But here you're giving the players these really cool, supernatural characters to choose from. Let them feel tough at least when they're fighting the super basic grunts and barrels. Don't, just to get my trash turkey or, like, points, don't make me take ten swings with a giant log as a super powerful, supernatural warrior. Don't make it take that many attacks for me to destroy a barrel, please. Yeah, if it was, like, maybe two hits... Maximum. It be so bad, but, like, yeah. it can take... Or one really like strong hit. Yeah. That looked like it took, like, eight attacks. That I will edit and count. I'll put footage again and I'll actually count how many attacks it took to destroy the barrel. But it was ridiculous. I was going to mention it at the time, but we were talking about something more relevant. Very nice magical effects for this guy. Yeah, he's... But he's invulnerable way too much. Like, that's the cheap way to make a boss last a long time and uh, eat quarters. Right. It's a damn good thing these are virtual quarters we're wasting. <laughs> Because, like I said, keep in mind this, uh, I need more tokens, that's ridiculous. Keep in mind this game was not sponsored by Fightcade, but, uh, <laughs> definitely do give that a, give that a look, because very impressed. If you want to play, oh, and the other cool thing about Fightcade, other people log in, and they, you, you tell Fightcade what games are your favorite, and you set them up in the emulation folder with the ROM. And then you log in, and if anyone else wants to also play that game of yours, uh, it's, so it's not just with your friends and you have to schedule a time to play with a friend. At any point, if you want to play any of these classic games, uh, once you have that ROM set up and have it set up as one of your games in there, um, you could see if anyone else is available to play. And I was shocked with Sengoku 3, which is an obscure game. There's always been at least one other person online that was available to play. <laughs> there we go. One punch. I uh, got yeah. him down. Yeah, we can put the, the link to the fight cave thing yeah. uh, uh, in the description. Yeah. Imagine if that was not the final boss. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, as you had mentioned, that font is way too anti-aliased. All it did was make it far less readable. They could have had a nice, clean, uh, clean pixel art font, just like the credits 06, that would have matched the rest of the game better and been much easier to read. Yeah, and I guess the credits thing was a built-in Neo Geo font. Uh, or something well, like it was oh good question games. i have no yeah. idea so i think this was definitely like it was just the developers of this game uh, making that decision yeah it, it felt when you're at that resolution it's yeah. like if you're looking at it blown up or whatever it, it's gonna just blur it out right yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, look, we're looking at it in a crystal clear LCD screen, and it still looks fuzzy as hell. Right, yeah. Yeah. Like that. That was, And by the way, everyone, I realized in our intro, I said Dream Factory. It's Noise Factory uh, oh. was the developers, and they did a fantastic job. So kudos to everyone here. I am not going to embarrass myself trying to uh, pronounce everyone's name. 
But yeah, right. the, fan, very, very uh, skillful and clearly passionate team. Uh, Top notch uh, slash them up game. Yeah, it's, it's the quality's up there. Uh, yeah. It's, a, it's something that, and it was imaginative too, you know, yeah. it had a lot of things I didn't expect along the way, so it was pretty yeah. cool. Awesome. So that's about it. Sh should we force ourselves to keep... I, I feel like I'm almost dissing the rest of the team. Oh, who cares about special thanks? To end the video before the credits are done? So right, sh should yeah. we keep uh, rambling as the credits until it suppose, uh, wraps around? I suppose. I mean, around? what if there is something after the credits? Yeah, yeah, you never know. Like a Marvel co Marvel movie uh, Easter egg ending? Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what happens. I assume it'll just... Oh, we'll enter our names. I'm ah uh, ah uh, ah. Uh. Yeah. You're SNK, you too. Oh, we're both at <laughs> SNK. We took too long. Oh, just uh, game over. Yeah, I never l liked that as a matter of uh, sort of grammar and storytelling. When you beat the game, don't give us a game over screen. Yeah. Even if the image is positive and stuff, don't call it game over. It's just negative uh, psychologically. The right, connotation. I agree. But anyway, yep, that will be it for this video. We hope it was enjoyable and hopefully uh, some food for thought in regard to the art and gameplay stuff. And uh, thanks very much for watching. If you enjoy our content and want to keep up to date on our games, please leave a like and subscribe. Also, if you want to support our projects, consider becoming a patron. The link's in the description and we'll see you soon.